And in this particular letter, it was a friend from college. And for some reason, I lost it that day. And I'm just going to validate anyone that is to that point where you're like not hopeful. You've had a number of miscarriages. Maybe you've tried a lot of infertility treatments. You've talked to specialists. Everyone around you is getting pregnant. And you're just like at your breaking point. And you're kind of feeling like all the dreams you had are on hold and you don't know when they're going to work out. That was the moment this letter came for me. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Middle. I'm Gaina Lynn Condi, your host. So glad that we have a few minutes to talk today to share an experience I've had with infertility. The middle of infertility is sometimes a long, lonely experience, but if you meet anyone else that has also had a journey with infertility, you immediately have common ground and connection. I have talked with many people that have experienced the heartbreak, the frustration of infertility, and there's something about it that is just a unique experience and complicated and different depending on who you're talking to. And on the middle, this is what we do. We invite friends to come to the yellow couch and talk about their middle stories. And we know that when we share stories with you, we're not making a statement that everyone in that situation has had the same experience, but we do try to make it personal so that hopefully it's relatable. That's what I want to share today. My experience with infertility, if you've uh, watched my episode on chronic illness, you'll know a little bit of the backstory of this middle. And that is that I was diagnosed with lupus and I was told early on that we would never have children. And I knew through some faith experiences that I would be a mother someday, but at that time of the diagnosis, that wasn't the priority. We didn't need to hyper-focus on becoming parents because in all reality, we were trying to keep me alive. I had a heart condition with lupus and I had some other complications with other organs and, and it was pretty serious for a while, but as time went on and that middle progressed and it became my new normal there, there's always been a part of me that knew I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to have that experience. And maybe you can relate. And I remember talking with my husband that like, this is the time, like it's time to start finding a specialist and figuring out a way in which we could really navigate around my diagnosis. So as we moved forward and we did meet with a specialist and we were able to have the conversation, then started this long process of trying. And for anyone that has an infertility journey, your experiences may be different. The pace of it, who you talk to, what you tried may vary. But one of the things that I know from interviewing amazing people here at the middle and my own experiences is that part of the pain of being in the middle is the not knowing. You don't know what's wrong. You don't know why it's not working. Why is it working for everybody else? And I happen to... I, friends of this show know that I identify as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints previously known as the Mormons, we have a lot of kids. There's a lot of babies being born. And I have given so many baby showers in my adult life that I remember feeling like, why am I part of a culture where it feels like babies are just happening? Like no one is even thinking about it. There's just babies everywhere. Everyone's always getting pregnant and having babies. And I felt like for uh, a lot of my journey through infertility, that this was a righteous thing I wanted. This was something good that I wanted. It wasn't like I was depressed or frustrated because we didn't have a bigger house or a fancier car. You know, I really felt like this is something good to want, to want to have a child. And, and I also feel like through infertility, we as men and women approach it different. For my husband, it was frustrating to constantly have month after month of you know, no positive pregnancy test and go through some of the testing we went through and talk with the specialists that we did. But I, I often felt like he was experiencing the grief or the stress of infertility differently than I was. And that as a mother or wanting to be a mother as a woman, this felt like this part of my identity that I, I just wrestled with, like how, no matter where I achieved, uh, in my career or in other areas of my life, this part of me was missing. And I'm just going to share that 
Usually when you're going through the middle, you have a long list of things that people say that aren't helpful. <laughs> and with infertility, I heard the craziest things, you know, um, in my faith, oftentimes people would think, well, we just didn't care about kids. So why weren't we having kids when family is so important in our faith? I also had people just like off offhandedly say, well, you can just adopt. Well, especially with my lupus diagnosis, I knew that that wasn't like we could just go to Target and find a baby and adopt. But people would say things like that to us, like, were we just not focused? Were we not really into kids? What was our problem? Were we putting our careers first? And so at some point, I think for any of us that are wrestling with the middle, you have to laugh about it. You have to find ways to make it kind of doable and funny. So my husband and I would come up with like really probably inappropriate responses for those inappropriate questions. One of my favorites was, um, well, we're just not really into kids and we want a lot of money and they're expensive. And people would look at us like, are you serious? No, like I was an elementary school teacher. I was into kids, you know, or at the time we had a little Yorkshire Terrier that we had rescued. And so we started telling people when they would ask that uncomfortable question about why we didn't have children or what was our problem, we would say, well, we're really into rare dogs and that's what we're going to find fulfillment in. And there would be this awkward silence, but it was our way of kind of coping with the frustration and the emotions and the, and the unknown. Like every middle story we share here on the show, it's the unknown that is sometimes the most painful part of the process. And so we would try to laugh, laugh about it. And I think the other thing in a more serious note that was hard for me was that when friends would find out that they were pregnant and they weren't comfortable sharing it with me. And so if you're going through this and you're finding this episode, I hope you feel validated in some of the things I've said. But one thing I know helped me is I told the people close to me, please, if you find out you're pregnant, I'm happy for you. You know, eventually I'm going to notice, <laughs> you know, if your tummy's growing and then you bring a baby home, I'm going to know you had a kid. And so I want, I want you to know that I appreciate you being sensitive to my feelings, but I don't want you to whisper. I don't want you to hide it from me. I want to celebrate this baby coming because babies are what we want, you know, so we want to celebrate with you. And then I would have my friends or family members that I knew I could process my emotions with, my vulnerability with, and, and that was my way of, of not building up those resentments. I'm not going to lie. There was a breaking point for me at one point. We had been trying and working with doctors and had gone on. We were probably at our five and a half year mark. It took seven years to have our son and six years to have our daughter. That's kind of where our infertility journey covered. But I think it was around the five year mark where I remember getting kind of resentful and irritated. <laughs> and I, this is not to offend because I just told you that I really appreciated people celebrating their pregnancies with me. I really did. And I still love to give baby showers, even if at times they were triggering and emotional for me. Right. But there was this day where we got, it was about a year before we we were able to finally have our child, but we got a Christmas card in the mail. And this is back in the olden days where there was like no social media, there was no texting, there was no email. And so it was old school, right? You got your, your once a year letter and you would find out how someone was doing. And in this particular letter, it was a friend from college. And for some reason I lost it that day. And I'm just going to validate anyone that is to that point where you're like not hopeful. You've had a number of miscarriages. Maybe you've tried a lot of infertility treatments. You've talked to specialists. Everyone around you is getting pregnant and you're just like at your breaking point. And you're kind of feeling like all the dreams you had are on hold and you don't know when they're going to work out. That was the moment this letter came for me. <laughs> I read this letter and it's basically, I'm paraphrasing, it's so we have some great news. We, we decided this was the year we wanted to have a baby and we got pregnant right away. And uh, I gained only about 12 pounds and I taught Zumba and uh, aerobics classes. I think it was probably aerobics. I think Zumba hadn't been created yet, but aerobics classes the whole nine months. I had a three hour labor and our baby, I mean, you guys literally insert as many eye rolls 
as you can because that I was just done. I I remember having the biggest fit. My husband was like, what just happened? And I was crying and yelling. And basically the letter ended with that she was back, back teaching aerobics classes and in her jeans, so to speak. And I just thought, okay, so happy for you. But you know, that's not my story. And for some reason, the dam broke that day and all these emotions came out and frustrations. And I'm going to say there's a place for that. You can laugh, come up with little funny responses that you want to give at a dinner party when people ask the uncomfortable conversation question of why don't you have kids yet? I I hope that you hear some solutions on how to navigate the the ambiguity of infertility. But there's also a place for the true emotion, the emotion of heartbreak and wanting something that is a really good thing to want, you know, to love and bring a child into your life and be a parent. I think there's nothing greater or harder to do. And so I just want to give permission that if you're navigating this middle And, or if you love someone that does, you have a friend or a family member that you kind of think maybe something's going on. I don't think it's inappropriate to sit down and say, Hey, listen, I don't want to offend. I don't want to pry into your personal business, but I wanted to talk to you about having kids. Is there support I can give? Are you guys talking about it? Are you wrestling with it? Maybe you've sensed that there's some emotion there. I think there's always room for asking a loving question and asking someone to share with you how they're feeling about something. Fast forward, we were able to finally have our son and it was a high risk pregnancy. And with lupus, my, my miscarriage rate was really high. We chose to tell people right away when we were, we found out we were pregnant and that's really a personal decision. But I decided to do that because I had waited so long to have a baby and to get pregnant that I knew that if I lost this baby, at any point in the process that I was going to be a disaster emotionally. And I didn't want the people closest to me to not know why I was maybe not going to be my best. And that's a personal decision because the reality is infertility usually is connected with miscarriage stories. And we did have a miscarriage and we didn't tell people about it. It was after the fact. And from then on, As we navigated two more pregnancies, I made sure I let people know. And that was a really good decision for me on an emotional level because I wanted to celebrate this pregnancy. And there was so much leading up to getting pregnant that was really scary and unknown that I just didn't want to look back on my whole pregnancy and just be in fear and anxiety. My mother-in-law gave me great advice that if everything went right, would I want to look back and know that that everything was right, but I had spent the whole time worrying. And there was a lot to worry about. There were a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of checking on a, on a lot of levels. Uh, we were able to have a son who came early, but he was 10 pounds. So it was probably good. He came early. And then it was another six years before we were able to have our daughter. And that was another infertility story. If you're watching this episode and you're struggling, but you've already had a baby, that's a unique part of infertility as well, that you've already had a child. And so sometimes the world's kind of like, well, you have a kid, you're fine. And we knew our family wasn't complete. And so in trying to have our daughter, that was a whole nother layer of emotions and questions. I love using scripture. That's one of my, my points of of grounding and foundation for my faith when I'm wrestling with things is scripture and prayer. And I used to take a lot of comfort. I still do in the stories of infertility that are in the Bible. They're plentiful. One of my favorite Bible um, heroines is Hannah. And she tells a wonderful story of trying to have a baby and she's not been able to have a baby. And one day the high priest sees her crying. I actually write about her in one of the books I wrote called Mother to Mother where she's crying and, and this high priest thinks she might be like intoxicated because she's so emotional and she kind of corrects him and teaches him, no, I just really want to have a baby. And if you know the story of Hannah, she finally does have a baby, but she's promised God that she'll turn her child over to the prophet to go live and to be taught to become a prophet after she has her child. And that is exactly what she does. And what's so emotional to me about Hannah is there's a part in the Bible where you read that she makes her baby 
a little coat every year and she goes to visit him. I love how Hannah was willing to sacrifice this thing. She had waited so long to have this child that she loved. And I love the idea that as a mother, God really is aware of us. He's aware of the men and women that want children. Sarah is also another story of infertility in the Bible. And, and I appreciate that Hannah's story doesn't end there. She goes on to have many other children, but through that experience, I really like to visualize that she learned so much and in the process taught this high priest more about sensitivity and empathy. She could have gotten offended that he said the wrong thing and people are going to say the wrong things. They don't always know what we're in the middle of, especially if you've kept it private, which is totally fine. I love that Hannah didn't get so mad that she got offended and never spoke to him again. No, she turned to him and she just said, Listen, this is something I want so badly. You saw me crying. And then the story in the Bible shows he blessed her. And I can imagine that if we knew the rest of that, that he went on to be more sensitive to others that maybe were going through their own infertility story. So just know, first and foremost, I believe in my faith that God hears all of our prayers. And if we continue to petition him, he either strengthens us in the middle of our stories that we're wrestling with, or he delivers us. It's either or. Sometimes I feel like, and maybe you do too, that God doesn't hear your prayers, that he's not hearing what you're asking for. And it's a good thing to be praying for. And I've come to see that it's in those times where my heart can start to get hardened. If I remember though, that he hears all of our prayers, he hears them, but he doesn't necessarily answer them always in the way we think or in the time. I have a good friend that says, we can knock on the door of heaven, but it's God's determination how that door is open and when that door is open. But it's always opened. For our family, it took seven years and we were able to have that little boy. And I remember in the moment that I saw that positive pregnancy test, that literally all seven years of wondering and praying and frustration and irritation and going into comparisons with other couples that seemed to easily just start their family went away. And the minute they handed me that 10 pound baby, I, I just felt like in that moment, there were parts of my heart that were healed. And honestly, for a while I thought, okay, our family's good if this is it, but we really knew there was another, another person that needed to be in our family. And I'm so grateful that God sent us our daughter Our daughter and our son are six years apart, which for some people, that's a really big gap, but they are the dearest, closest uh, siblings I've really ever met. And they have both taught me so much about God's timing. And I also want to share that there was a point where the doctor said to us that it was safe for me to try to have a baby, that we knew that the end of the story would maybe end in adoption. And we were open to that. Some families aren't, but for us, we were willing to be parents in any way God felt would be best for us. And so instead of buying a whole bunch of baby clothes, I wanted to commemorate that day with something that helped me feel something that was tangible. So when the doctor said it was okay and safe for us to try to have a baby, I went and bought a journal. And this journal was specific for our child someday. And we didn't know how that child would come. And I started writing pretty regularly my thoughts and feelings for our future child. And I remember writing one day specifically, I don't know how you'll come. I don't know if you'll come through adoption. I don't know if you'll come uh, the traditional way, but I want you to know you're loved and you're wanted. And it was a it was a way for me to stay hopeful, to keep my heart open so that I didn't get stuck in being angry that it hadn't happened yet, but that I had a place to go so that that mother heart in me would stay alive and beating. And I think that that would be the takeaway that I would offer is that be open to whatever way God is going to answer your prayer. And maybe you found this episode and infertility isn't your thing. That's not your middle you're wrestling with. But I've come to know that all the lessons of all the middles I've gone through have helped me in future stories I'm going to navigate. And one of the things I learned the most from the infertility story for me and for my husband is that spouses navigate 
vulnerability differently. He had his own range of emotions. He had his own concerns and he had his own feelings once we became parents as well. You know, I remember the day we went into early labor with my son and we went to the hospital and we came home and the doctors, you know, everything had kind of quieted down and they sent us home, but I could kind of feel that my baby was coming. And so my to-do list was the most important thing. My husband, he's going to kill me for sharing this with you. He went and took a nap <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, like the baby's not coming today. So I probably should go take a nap. And for me, it was like, I better get everything done because the baby's going to be here soon. That's just a funny example of how we navigate our feelings. One is not right or wrong. He really did. He had been fighting a cold. And so he knew he needed to get some sleep so he could be ready for when the baby got there. And I was going to do the total opposite and try to get everything done. So whether you're on the front end or in the middle of this story of infertility, or maybe you've had a baby and you're now trying for your second or your third, I'm just going to validate that give yourself permission, your partner permission to have any feelings they need to have around this and stay open, do what you need to do to keep a soft heart. And that might be that you throw a fit one day because you hear another story of someone else that didn't want to get pregnant and they got pregnant and they're frustrated about it. Or like the letter I shared with you, someone else shares with you how easily it was for them to start their family. And that's not your experience. Give yourself space to have those emotions and then open up the conversation with the people closest to you. I think it's so important to have a tribe a support group, a support system. Maybe it's that you follow an Instagram account or a, a social media account where someone is open about their journey and that's where you find your validation. When I was going through that, we didn't have that. I'm a little bit older. Um, I'm so glad that we have that now where we have these opportunities, these platforms like the middle where we can connect with each other and we can open conversations up to what our plans, when they don't look like we thought they were gonna look, how we can keep going forward. I didn't stop living my life while we were going through infertility. I tried to keep growing in other areas of my life, but I also didn't want to abandon this dream. I didn't want to act like I didn't want to be a mom anymore. And I went through that for a while. I tried to trick myself out of feeling sad by saying, well, maybe I don't want to be a mom. And I played around with those feelings for a while. And I knew that wasn't for me, that there was a part of me that in some form, in some way in the future, I hoped God would provide an opportunity for me to mother. I didn't know how or when or what that would look like, but I wanted to keep that part of my heart soft and open to that experience. So I'm going to invite you to do the same. I want to validate that this is, this is an emotional journey and it, it's easy to feel like everyone else is having it work out perfectly and they're all getting the perfect baby products bought and their nursery looks Pinterest perfect. And you're the one who's struggling again with maybe a miscarriage or uh, more infertility testing. I hope that you will fill my prayers for you through this video, that you will have the strength that either the burden is removed or you are strengthened through it and that your prayers are answered. Even if, if, even if it looks different than you thought it would look. And thank you again for joining us here on The Middle, where we share these sensitive stories. We try to talk about these topics that are sometimes really private. We hope that this is a place where you can come and receive that validation and the opportunity to come up with ideas for your next steps when you're feeling like you've hit another dead end and you don't know what else to try. I hope that you will find some ideas and, and solutions here on The Middle. And we'll see you again soon here on The Middle.